A 14-year-old boy bunks off school and is never seen again. What happened to Andrew Gosden? Andrew Gosden was born on the 10th of July, 1993 in Balby, a suburb of Doncaster, South Yorkshire. He grew up with his parents, Kevin and Glennis Gosden, as well as his sister, Charlotte. Andrew's parents were active in the church and local communities, but made a point of not pushing their religion onto their children. With Andrew and Charlotte free to attend church if they so wished and had not been baptized, Andrew attended the Macaulay Catholic High School and was described as a gifted student, one of the top 5% of pupils. Combined with a 100% attendance record, Andrew was expected to fly through the GCSE and a level exams and was reported as being destined for Cambridge, arguably England's most prestigious school. When described by his friends, Andrew Gosden was said to be quite happy with his own company but mixed well with like-minded individuals. By all accounts, in 2007, 14-year-old Andrew Gosden was outwardly a happy but quiet intellectual. He had spent part of the summer break at Lancaster University's gifted and talented program. Andrew's parents recalled that he returned from the summer school being uncharacteristically enthused by the events of the program. During the summer, Andrew's parents had also suggested that he travel alone to London to stay with his grandmother, but he did not wish to go. In the days leading up to his disappearance, Andrew had twice chosen to stray from his usual routine. Typically, Andrew would take the bus home from school, which was around four miles away from his home. However, in recent days, his parents reported that he told them he walked home from school rather than taking the bus. There was no explanation offered for this change in route by Andrew. He had also broken his phone and declined the offer of a replacement from his parents. The night before he disappeared was described as uneventful by Andrew's father. The family of four ate together and all helped wash the dishes afterwards. Andrew later spent an hour making a jigsaw with his father and watched TV with his mother. By all accounts, a normal evening. Despite this, just a week after he had returned to school, following the summer break on the 14th of September, he disappeared. On the 14th of September, 2007, Andrew woke up later than usual and was slightly irritable, which was deemed to be unusual by his mother. Andrew left home at 8.05 a.m. and began his usual walk from home through Westfield Park to his usual bus stop. Whilst walking through the park, he was seen by Alan Murray, a reverend at the local church and friend of the family. However, instead of getting on the school bus, Andrew took a detour to a local garage, using the cash machine to withdraw as much as he could out of his account, 200 pounds. Minutes later, he was seen on a neighbor's CCTV returning to his house. Back at home, Andrew changed into a black slipknot t-shirt and jeans, leaving his school blazer on the back of his chair and putting the rest of his uniform in the washing machine. He took a bag, his wallet, keys, and his PSP, or PlayStation Portable console. And at 8.30 a.m., Andrew left his home for the second time that day. According to his father, there was 100 pounds cash in his room that was left untouched as well as his passport. The family also noted the fact that he did not take his PSP charger with him as significant. Andrew was seen on his neighbor's CCTV heading down Littlemore Lane once more and walking towards Westfield Park. Andrew arrived at Doncaster Station a short while later, where he purchased a one-way ticket to King's Cross Station, London. Later, the ticket seller described advising Andrew that he was told a return ticket was just a small amount more. Some suggest that the one-way ticket signifies that Andrew did not plan to return home whilst others see it as more of a red herring with nothing sinister behind it. As I said earlier, Andrew was described as shy, and he was also deaf in one ear. He could have easily misheard the ticket seller and not wanted to ask them to repeat themselves. At 9.35, Andrew boarded the train alone and sat next to a woman who later described him as quiet, but fixated on his PSP game. During this time, Macaulay High School had attempted to get in contact with his parents to report his absence but had dialed the wrong number accidentally and left a message for the wrong parents. Andrew's train pulled into King's Cross less than two hours later, and at 11.25 a.m., he was seen on CCTV leaving the main entrance. This is the last ever confirmed sighting of Andrew Gosden. Because Andrew was supposed to have been in school that day, his absence wasn't noticed by his parents until 7 p.m. that night. At home, they had assumed he was downstairs in their converted cellar playing video games. Upon realizing he was missing, the police were immediately called and his family and friends searched the area and circulated missing person leaflets. Three days later, police confirmed that Andrew had traveled to London after speaking to the ticket seller, who spoke on the strangeness over the one-way versus return ticket detail. Following this, police and family searches focused on areas within London, Sidcup, and Chislehurst, where the family had relatives. 
The family also extended the search, handing out flyers at places Andrew would have liked to visit. The police also requested that the British Transport Police review their CCTV footage in an attempt to see Andrew's movements once the train arrived in London. Two weeks later, he was identified in the footage due to his distinctive double ridge on his right ear. One year, September 14, 2007, there had been 45 possible reported sightings of Andrew in London and a further 122 across Britain. However, none of these sightings have been able to be confirmed or substantiated. Andrew's family believed the most plausible sighting was on the day he went missing, in Pizza Hut on Oxford Street, about an hour's walk from King's Cross Station. Whilst the family believed this to have been significant, Andrew's father has claimed it was not followed up by the police. There was another reported sighting that matched Andrew's description on October 17th in Covent Garden, which was followed up later but ultimately did not further the investigation. In late 2008, a year after Andrew had disappeared, a man visited Leo Minster Police Station in Herefordshire, West Midlands. This station was unmanned and the man used an intercom system to talk to a police officer, stating that he had information about Andrew. By the time an officer had arrived to take the details, the man had left. The police station was located in a business park with limited public transport. Who had taken the trip there just to leave before speaking to someone? Appeals by police for the man to come forward have since turned up nothing. Later, an anonymous individual wrote to the BBC One Show, claiming to be the man in the police station after Andrew's case had featured on The One Show. The anonymous account gave details of a possible sighting of Andrew in Shrewsbury in November 2008, but this is unconfirmed. In September 2009, to mark the second anniversary of his disappearance, Andrew's parents made a fresh appeal with age progress pictures of what Andrew may look like, age 16. In November 2009, Gosden's family considered the possibility that Gosden could have been struggling with his sexual orientation, so Kevin Gosden appealed to the gay community to help find his son. Kevin stated, We are a pretty open family, so have wondered if he was gay or struggling with his sexual identity and found it too awkward to raise. If he is gay, we do not have any issue with it. He is loved unconditionally by both my wife and I and his sister. There have also been reported attempts to locate him over the years. Investigators in the media alike have spoken with Kevin Gosden regularly to keep his son's case fresh in the mind of the UK. Recently, an update to the case was revealed. Over 15 years after Andrew disappeared, two men were arrested in connection with the case on December 8, 2021 in London. The Metropolitan and South Yorkshire Police worked together to detain the two men. A 45-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of human trafficking, kidnap, and possession of indecent images of children. And a 38-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of human trafficking and kidnap. Both have been released pending further investigation and have had their devices seized by police for further investigation. Let's look at some theories as to what people believe could have happened to Andrew. People have theorized online that Andrew's disappearance could be connected to the murder of Alex Slowly. The general gist of this theory is that Andrew was murdered and was murdered by the same person who murdered Alex Slowly. Alex was just 16 when he disappeared. Not only was he just a couple of years older than Andrew, but was also reported to excel in school in the same way that Andrew did. Alex disappeared on July 11, 2008, just two days before his 17th birthday. Mick Neville, a retired head of the London Metropolitan Police Central Images Unit, believes in the possibility there could be a connection having said, it raises the question on whether there is a serial killer on the prowl. The potential links between these cases need to be recognized, but so far, no further information about this theory has surfaced. Another big theory online is that Andrew went to see a concert in London, one that he knew his parents would not allow due to not wanting him to miss school. Andrew was a big fan of music, having been to shows with his parents before of his favorite bands. 30 Seconds to Mars, Sixth, and him were all playing in London that night. A lot of commenters online suggest that he may have been turned away from the music venue due to his age and young looks. Most of these bands would have had at least 16 and over age restrictions. But why didn't he come home afterwards? Did he meet with foul play whilst leaving the venue? Another theory looks at the possibility Andrew was groomed online and went to London to meet up with whoever he was speaking to. This theory is that Andrew could have had a secret social media presence that nobody knew about. Could Andrew have gone to London to meet someone who had been grooming him online? He was a shy and quiet young looking 14 year old boy, a potential target for predators. As I mentioned earlier, he had chosen to walk the hour and 20 minute journey home from school in the days leading up to his disappearance. It's possible that he was using this time to talk to someone, someone that he felt he couldn't introduce to his family. However, as mentioned earlier, 
At the time of his disappearance, Andrew was without a phone. Computers in the school were searched, but contained no evidence that Andrew was communicating with anyone. There was no record of an account or communication on his PSP, and his father also stated that Andrew did not have an email address. But that doesn't mean someone closer to home hadn't taken advantage of him. If not online, could he have been groomed by someone local to him? Someone he had met previously was involved, and it would help his change in routine. Why did he start walking home in the afternoon after school instead of taking the bus? Was he getting a lift? Did anyone see him walking that distance home? It would also open the possibility that Andrew did not need to buy a return ticket the day he went to London if he had believed he was meeting someone there who would later take him back to Doncaster. Remember his summer school, which he was uncharacteristically enthused about afterwards. It's entirely possible that he met someone there, but without a phone and next to no internet access, it's unlikely they would have been able to communicate afterwards. Still, it does leave open the question of who this mysterious predator, if they exist, was. Did Andrew simply become the victim of an encounter gone wrong? It's impossible to fully dismiss because of a lack of evidence, but difficult to substantiate. Again, the last confirmed sighting of Andrew was him leaving King's Cross on the day he went missing. It is possible that Andrew decided spur of the moment to bunk off and explore London for the day as an exciting novelty in establishing some independence. Whilst police and the public speculate on the one-way ticket scenario, it wasn't impossible for Andrew to purchase another ticket for his home journey, or whether London even was his final destination. It's credible that at that age, Andrew just didn't understand the buying process, thinking it was easier to just purchase another ticket when he decided to go home. He also had relatives in London and likely knew if anything went wrong, he could always go and stay with them as a backup. Was he simply taking the day to explore and met with foul play? Another theory looks at Andrew's changing behavior in the weeks leading up to his disappearance. Did Andrew leave his home to commit suicide? This theory would explain some of his changes in behavior and how generally socially isolated he was. But why travel to London to enact his plan? Whilst this is a big theory online, it's one that just doesn't add up when you examine the details of the case for a few reasons. Like I said, if Andrew was planning to kill himself, why would you go to the CCTV capital of the UK, a place where he was bound to have been seen, except for the fact he wasn't? Is it truly likely that in such a bustling city, nobody stopped to wonder why such a young boy was alone? Andrew also withdrew 200 pounds to take to London with him. Why would you take such a large amount if you were planning to take your own life? And lastly, did Andrew simply run away? This theory is one of the more out there ideas. However, the available evidence does suggest that Andrew intended to go home either that day or the day after. He didn't take a change of clothes or his PSP charger. He also left 100 pounds in his room. If he was going to run off to start a new life, why didn't he pack? Though it's unlikely that a 14 year old boy with only 200 pounds to his name could survive, let alone in London, it has been suggested that he could have squatted somewhere or fallen in with a crowd of other homeless people in the city until he was old enough to make his way. But his disappearance was highly publicized. Could he have gone unnoticed in the capital? In 2018, this theory came to life when someone on an online forum with the username Andy Rue asked for money, saying that they'd left home when they were 14. When offered by other users, Andy Rue declined to say that because they'd left home, they didn't have access to a bank account. Andrew's father spoke about this incident to Vice News in 2018, saying, Last year, around the time of the 10th anniversary of Andrew's disappearance, we received a tip from somebody who said he'd been talking to someone named Andy Rue online. The person our contact was talking to said, My partner has just walked out and I need help. Our contact offered to help, asked Andy Rue what he needed. Andy Rue told him he needed 200 pounds to make rent. Our contact noticed Andy Rue was listed as living in Lincoln, some distance from him, and so offered to transfer some money to help him out. Andy Rue said he didn't have a bank account because he left home when he was 14. He said he just felt like it. What's interesting about this is that our nickname for Andrew as a kid was Rue. The police made inquiries with the web admins, continues Kevin. They asked us to keep it quiet while they did so. Unfortunately, the website had recently changed its system and lost a lot of data, so they couldn't give us any user data. Since then, We've been driving around Lincoln looking for someone who looks like Andrew, but nothing has come of it. It's another dead end. This incident is likely a red herring. If you had run away from home and are trying to avoid detection, would you use your old nickname to identify yourself? Since his disappearance, Andrew's dad has continued to raise awareness and search for answers about his son. He regularly appears in different media, from podcasts to TV appeals, and works tirelessly for answers. 
Kevin works closely with the national charity Missing People, collating useful information to help the wider public in their search for Andrew. I will share this link and all others in the description. This information is also available on Kevin's blog at www.helpustofindandrew.weebly.com. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of Andrew, please call or text 116 -000. It's free, 24-hour, and confidential. What do you think happened to Andrew? Did he simply run away? Or did something more sinister happen to him on that fateful September day? Comment your theories down below and make sure you take the time to read Andrew's father's blog.